This is Athletes as Educators with former pro basketball player, championship winning coach, and author, Angela R. Lewis. Angie Lewis interviews current and former athletes who are passionate about sharing the lessons they've learned and the experiences that have shaped their lives. A resource for parents. A guide for student athletes. A source for current and former athletes. Keys to transition off the court. Welcome to the Athletes as Educators podcast with Angela R. Lewis. Welcome to this episode of Athletes as Educators. I'm your host, Angie Lewis. So excited about our guest today. We have Ty Evans. Ty played basketball at Wisconsin Whitewater. Ty played professionally overseas, coached college ball for 15 years, one season overseas, and was my coach in college at St. Louis University. Ty, thank you so much for joining me today. Anything for you. Anything for you. You know that. I know. I know. We've had so many conversations over the years, and I'm just so excited that people can hear um, from one of from one of my mentors, big brothers. I mean, I'm just so, the woman I am today is directly reflected from what I've learned from you. And so today I just want us to talk about the college recruiting process, talk about your background and your love for the game. Okay, sounds good, let's shoot. So when did you, when did you start playing ball and why? And what has this game meant to you? Um, I started playing when I was five years old, I actually, I don't know if I should say this <laughs> in public, but uh, I got signed up to play at the Boys and Girls Club when I was five, when you know you have to be six years old to play. But my mama needed me. My mama needed uh, for me to be doing something constructive, so they signed me up a year early. And nevertheless, I, I loved it because I just loved, you know, I just loved being competitive when I was younger. I loved basketball, and basketball was, was fun. For me, and that's why I started playing. That was the only reason why I started playing. It was fun, you know. It was something that I could interact with other people. Um, I wasn't as competitive then, but I always remember winning. So I guess I was. <laughs> See, I was. <laughs> right. But 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 first and foremost, so it was fun. It's a game. Basketball is a game. I think sometimes, you know, the older you get, you forget that. You forget, you know, the reason why you picked up the ball for the first time. And I guarantee you. Most people, 98% of the people out there, if you ask them, you know, why they play, it was because it was fun. That was it, you know, and that's why I started playing because it was just something that I gravitated towards and it was fun for me and that's why I started playing, so. Mm -hmm. And then what impact has this game had on your life? Man, everything. I mean, there's nothing that I've done thus far in 44 years that basketball didn't play a role in. Nothing. I mean, if it wasn't for basketball, you can look at it this way. I wouldn't have met my wife. And if I wouldn't have met, if I wouldn't have met my wife, I wouldn't have had my beautiful kids. I would have never met you. Mm-hmm. I would have never had the opportunity to travel the world. I mean, you know, where I'm from in Wisconsin, there's a town of about 35,000 people. And pretty much the majority of the people that I grew up with, they're still there. And they're still there because they don't know that anything else exists. And if I didn't have basketball, I would be the exact same person. But because I was, you know, because I played basketball and, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to be good enough to where, you know, I could, I could play for AAU teams outside of the city. You know, I was able to experience, you know, leaving the city of Boyd, Wisconsin. So I was able to meet different people, interact with different people and travel the world basically. So, I can honestly say without basketball, I wouldn't have anything. I mean, it's mm-hmm. pretty much the central. Other than God and family, that's the most important thing in my life because of what it's brought me, you know, from a positive standpoint. So, you know, with me, it's real. When you talk mm-hmm. about basketball, I can't, I don't, I don't pretend when it comes to that because it's given me too much for me not to take it seriously. So, without basketball, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it's the truth. No, I know you, and I know it's the truth. I absolutely know that that you love the game. You love the game. You mentioned you mentioned that all you remember is winning. And one thing that um, I loved about you as a coach is that you're always trying to do whatever you can to help players win, like on the court, off the court. What's your what is your philosophy of the game? Well, the thing about when, let's go let's back up a little bit. The thing about winning 
you know, it's not necessarily winning and losing per se, but imagine playing a game, whether it's, you know, basketball or checkers or, you know, double dutch, anything. When you win, think about the feeling you have when you win. Winning builds self-esteem. Winning gives you confidence. So it's not just for the sake of winning. It's just what winning brings you, what it gives you. I think that's important, especially when you're young. You know, if you started playing basketball at five years old and you never won a game, you probably wouldn't like it. Yeah. I don't care how fun it was when you started playing, but winning is a part of that as well. So, you know, when you're younger and you start playing something because it's fun and you actually win at it, that, to, I mean, to me, that just takes it to a whole nother level. You know, you want to do it again because you love that feeling. You know, I can, I can take it in a totally different, uh, totally different manner. I know this may sound a little morbid, but unfortunately, you got people who, who are drug addicts. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, a lot of them, you know, they take that first hit and they feel like they've never felt. So what do they try to do? They spend the rest of their life trying to get to that first hit. That's how they become addicted. Well, winning is the exact same thing if you look at it from that standpoint. Once you get that feeling and you know how it makes you feel, you become addicted to it. That's a beautiful thing. You know, as long as you keep it in perspective, that's a beautiful thing. And that's what happened to me, you know. So it is about being competitive, but it's just that feeling of winning. You can't get past that. It's a beautiful thing. It is. It is a really, it is a really beautiful thing. And you've played, mm-hmm. you know, you've played at college level, played overseas, been coaching all this time. You've won some, you've lost some. How do you, how do you help players deal with success, but it's also failure? Well, the failure is when you grow. You know, you can't grow if you don't, you haven't encountered any adversity, because there's no one that's undefeated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse my language, on and off the court, no one. I mean, you're going to lose at some point, whether it's in practice or, you know, or, or high school, college, whatever. You're going to lose. So you have to be able to deal with that as well. you got to deal with it in a graceful manner because, to me, you grow through adversity. Losing is adversity. You have to be able to deal with that. And then once you go through enough of that, you would appreciate winning even more. Mm-hmm. That's what's important. It is, and that adversity shows you who you are and gives you an opportunity to step up or not. I remember before games, I used to play you one-on-one, and I just remember never winning. Won. You never won. <laughs> you had a lot of, you went through a lot of adversity. <laughs> I remember winning. No, but but um, really, really though, when you're a kid, everyone, to your point, everyone has been humbled at some point, Right. So mm-hmm. when you finally mm-hmm. win, it makes a difference. Growing up for you, who were those people that used to kick your butt and made you better? Because we all had them. Well, you know what? what's crazy is um, I never lost an organized game until I was in ninth grade. What? Not one. Yes, not one. I don't even know if you knew this. Like, I never, oh. I never lost an organized game from age five to, what, 14. So I never knew what it was like. I never lost. In an organized game. See, that's the key. Because I'm about, I'm about to answer your question here in a second. But you have to understand where I come from to understand what I'm about to tell you. So you know, basically for nine years, I never lost. A game where it mattered, I never lost. Right? Wow. But when I wasn't playing organized ball, I always played with guys that were older than me. My dad was 18 years older than me, so he was still young. So mm-hmm. when I was 18, he was 36, he was still playing. Mm-hmm. So I grew up playing with grown men. Guess what? When I wasn't playing organized ball, I never won. <laughs> so I had the best of both worlds. I was playing with guys that were older, more mature, but they taught me. They taught me humility because I never, I never won playing against them. So guess what? But I took those um, experiences. So when I was playing against guys my own age growing up, I never lost. So I had kind of the best of both worlds. And I never thought about this literally until like about five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's, absolutely. That's pretty amazing. And it's and the fact that you play with guys older than you and were humbled consistently gave you that fire to go out and want to kill other people, like put in the work against other people. I think oftentimes today, and bringing it to today, a lot of times kids aren't playing against people older than them and they're not going to the parks and just getting beat up on and um having the park. To, the park? Yeah. People still go to the parks? I don't. I don't think. Not like we used to. 
Definitely not like nah, those two. Nah, that's like an endangered species. Mm-hmm. And so, how has that changed the game? How has the game, how have players changed over the years because of this lack of being humbled as much? Well, in my estimation, you know, it's all about winning. And I'm, I'm just sitting here telling you winning is important. Yeah. You know, but I'm also telling you that losing builds humility and it builds character. I think right now the focus is on winning so much that people don't know Young players don't know how to handle adversity. Mm-hmm. If you look at the whole AEU thing, think about it. You you play three or four games in a day. Yeah. <laughs> if you lose the first game, how the, how bad does it hurt you? Because you know you're playing two three hours. Yeah. You know there's no there's no pickup basketball anymore when you go to the park and you play a game and you lose. You got to sit out two hours. So guess what? If you know you got to sit out two hours. You're going to do everything within your power to not lose because, you know, you may not get on the floor again. Absolutely. That's adversity. You mm-hmm. don't have that anymore because no one plays pickup, you know, or this organized pickup. Or you get the coach telling you, well, you don't want to play that. You don't want to play unorganized basketball. It's not good for you. Everything that I've learned that has mattered to me, yeah. I learned playing against guys that were 10, 12 years older than me in an unorganized fashion. I've only had three coaches that ever taught me anything. Mm. My best coaches were the guys who basically I played against in the park or in a rec league when I was probably the youngest guy out there, but they took it upon themselves to help me because they didn't want me to make the same mistakes they did. They saw something in me at that age that I didn't see in myself. You don't get that anymore. Now you got kids with trainers at seven, eight years old. Mm-hmm. You know, kids playing AE ball from three, four, mm-hmm. what, third, fourth, fifth grade. And they, and they can tell you the AE record, but they can't tell you the high school record. Exactly. <laughs> Think about that. We were 41 and 4 in the AAU. But like that really matters. Are you kidding me? 45. But you can't tell me your high school record. It's unbelievable. It is. And it's, That's it's, the problem. It's changed a lot. I, similarly, you know, my big brothers were my trainers, unofficially, <laughs> who didn't get paid. They kicked yeah, my butt really. in the backyard. And that's how you got that's how you got better. And and Ooh. some trainers are good, which is fine, but also there has to be this desire to want to win and want to get better that it doesn't matter if you have a trainer or not, you're still gonna put in that work. Right. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not disrespecting trainers, you know, overall. There's some good ones out there. I'm not saying it's bad overall. But when you don't just play, you have to play. You have to be faced with some adversity. When you haven't done that, you don't know how to lose. I'm going to tell you what happens now. What happens is because, you know, parents are enabling kids. They got trainers at eight years old. They're playing in leagues where if they don't get the ball the first two games, the parent moves them to another team. You know, if they're playing AAU ball, if the team is not playing them or they're not winning, they move to another team. So now by the time they get 11th grade, you got you got a kid that's played for four different A four different AAU teams, two high schools, and they have three different trainers. So guess what happens when they get to college? They transfer after they for freshman year because you know why? Not used to having adversity, and when they've had it in the past, you know what they do? They run, they switch up. That's the problem. That's it. And then it's always somebody else's fault. Mm-hmm. You know, where, where where I grew up, you go to the park, you lose, you don't play again. Guess what? You don't get a chance. You don't. You don't get a chance to get picked up on the next team to play. You gotta wait two hours if you play again that day. But you know what that teaches you? Next time I'm on that floor, I'm gonna do whatever it takes not to come off because I know if I come off, I might not get on there again. That right, that mentality right there helped me more than any basketball camp or tennis guy I ever went to. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the part of the beauty of playing in that way was that. Someone had to pick you up because they felt you were going to be valuable. So mm-hmm. if you didn't literally get picked to play on the team, because sometimes now like you can shoot for it to see if you can make it to see who has next. But it's something mm-hmm. it's really humbling when you have to when people keep just passing you be, until you get to the point where you you're the one who gets to pick the team. Hey, but you know what? That, to me, that. Art imitates life. That's mm-hmm. how life is. When you go to an interview for a job, it's the same thing. You're in, you have your interview on Tuesday. They have someone else coming on Wednesday. They have someone else coming on Thursday. And you might not get picked. But guess what? If you don't get picked, are you going to not try for another job? Exactly. What are you going to do? Yeah. But what happens now is they don't try for another job. They're so busy blaming the person that didn't pick them. They're not looking in the mirror and saying, okay, what can I do so that this never happens again? Mm-hmm. And that's what we're missing. Yeah. Instead of that, now you know what we do? 
You can't get any change. We get, a, we get a different trainer because we didn't play as much as Dad wanted me to the last game. So at some point, the person in the mirror has to be the one that's being held accountable. But you don't get that anymore. One of that's the, the problem. You mentioned about, you alluded to it a little bit about coaches and parents and that relationship. Oh I, I was talking to oh. someone earlier about the significance of that relationship. Can you talk about how can we make it better? Your, your immediate response shows that it's not good. And we, we how do, how does in my estimation, mm-hmm. you have some good ones out there. Like I said, I'm not generalizing or, or putting everybody in one category. I would never do that. You know, that's, that's not, that's basically immature. Basically, okay. you can't do that. But overall, in general, if you look at the state of basketball, especially grassroots basketball, just look at it. I mean, don't take my word for it. Just, just pay attention. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you, for the most part, you have parents. More parents are coaching. Mm. They're not coaching because they love to coach. They're coaching because my kid ain't getting what they should be getting from somewhere else. And I can do it better. No, that's not what they're really saying. What they're really saying is, I got to make sure my kid gets an opportunity. Mm-hmm. But you're not looking out for the other kids. You know what I mean? Right. The kid who may not have a parent involved. So your kid may get an opportunity, but what about everybody else? You know, the problem, like I said before, the problem right now, and I, I give parents a lot of credit because they want what's best for the kids so bad, yeah. which is a good thing, but this is the bad part. They're enabling them. You got kids who can't even fill out an application. They can't even get in school. Their parents are doing it. So guess what? When they have the first bad practice, you know what they do? They're on, they're on their lock, they're on their phone in the locker room texting their parents saying this place is not for me. Because you know why? Because it worked in eighth grade, it worked in tenth grade, and it worked in eleventh grade. I've changed, like I said before, I've changed trainers, I've trained, I've changed high school coaches, I've changed AU teams, I'm about to change colleges. When we get off the phone, go look at the transfer rate in the last three or four years. I guarantee you it's it's increased significantly. But you ain't, you don't even, I'm like, you just pay attention. <laughs> it didn't happen in college. It started in ninth grade with AAU or individual trainers. So, Nobody wants to go through anything. It's always somebody else's fault. So I want to push back a little me. bit. How do you know when it's a good fit? Like, so there, I'm sure there are some situations that are not a good fit or it's a bad situation. How does a parent or a kid know when it's time to go or stay? I don't think there's a um, there's a there's a handbook mm-hmm. where you can say okay here, here's the checklist if this is not happening and this is not happening and this is not happening you should leave I think everybody is different but I also think you got to know what it is you're looking for in that particular school before you go yeah. the first time people are not doing their homework mm-hmm. you got you got players and, and play parents choosing schools based on what shoes they wear yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> I mean literally. You know, so you've got to do more research and do your homework ahead of time, you know, and that's the thing, you know. So what are some things? When you pick, when you, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You can finish. You can finish. I mean, think about it this way. When, you, when you're picking a school, it's, it's amazing to me. I mean, I've been doing this for 15, 16 years, and you can talk to uh, players, you can talk to parents, and they can tell you anything. I think sometimes they forget what they tell you. Because every coach is pretty much asking the same thing. Like, right. what are you looking for in the school? That's a that's a very general question. Oh, I can tell you what they're going to say. I just want somewhere where it feels like family. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. always, oh, I just want a good education. Well, if you work hard and you study hard, I mean, pretty much, you can get an education wherever you go. I know some educated people who didn't even go to college. That's right. on you. You know? Now, don't get me wrong. I know Harvard and, you know, the Ivy League schools and, after they have a different academic reputation, but don't just tell me you want to get a good education because that's on you. You can get a good education anywhere. <laughs> well, you know, we want to we want to be a part of a family, you know, and then obviously you want a chance to play. Well, guess what? If that's all you're looking for, that's pretty much it. Every coach is going to tell you they're going to give you that. I don't know a coach out here that's going to say we're not going to give you a good education, right. or I'm recruiting you to not play. <laughs> Think about how dumb that sounds. <laughs> Or we're not going to be family. You're not going to be able to call me. I'm going to be able to help you. <laughs> so what are you really looking for? I think parents and players need to sit down and really try to figure out what's most important. Because what's most important, if you're getting that, to me, the chances of you transferring is going to 
decrease significantly. But if you ain't being honest with yourself and being honest with the people you're talking to, then you're probably going to look for a better place that's going to make you feel good in the moment. Most of the time, it depends on playing time. I'm just being honest with you. And look, you have a, when was the last time you heard of somebody transferring because academically it wasn't what they thought it was going to be? No one. That's my point. Don't bring it up in the recruiting process. Yep. Yep. No one says, I got there, they didn't have my major, or the professor was so horrible, I mean, so I left. Yeah, my academic environment was so bad, I had to transfer. You never hear that. No. It's always playing time. I don't like how the coaches treat me. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in some cases, but in all cases? Come on. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to be kidding me. <laughs> y'all got to be kidding me. So but what that's the, the truth, though. What are those things that are maybe intangible that parents should be thinking about or looking for? You know, some parents, some parents, this is their first kid who's gone through this college recruiting process. They never played college ball. What should they be thinking about? Oh, I get it. Talk to the people that are no longer a part of the program. Mm. Talk to them. Talk to individuals who have transferred and ask them why. Talk to seniors. Seniors have, 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 um, for, for, for whatever reason, maybe because it's because they're almost out the door, you got a better chance of a senior being honest with you than you do with anybody else. True. You know, talk, when you go to the school, you spend all this time with the head coach and the assistant coach, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to put their best foot forward. You know why? You know why? It's just like being on a date. If you've been on the first date and somebody went out of their way to not treat you right, what okay. do you think you're going to get? But I'll tell you what, spend some time talking to that janitor when you first walk in. That saying hi to everybody and know everybody, that's the person you can talk to. When you go to the cafeteria and that one person that's that's over the chicken parmesan <laughs> that all your players talk to when they walk in yeah. and they know them by name, that's the person you ought to be talking to. They're going to tell you the truth. Pay attention. Look at transfer rates. Mm -hmm. You know? Matter, as a matter of fact, look at the history of where the head coach came from. Look at the transfer rates from other schools. Then, and then do your research. Find out why. Mm -hmm. That'll tell you everything you need to know. Talk to the player. Look, go, on, go, on, go online or Synergy or whatever you got to go on and, and look at the player who's, who's receiving the least amount of minutes. Mm -hmm. And when you get on campus, talk to that person. That'll tell you a lot about the whole program. A lot about the program. I'm telling you. The person who's not playing at all. Right. Not, not, not just the walk-on, the scholarship player who's not getting any minutes. Ask her how her, pro her recruiting process was. Mm -hmm. That'll tell you a lot more than them showing you how you can fit in and be a star in the next three or four years and they can help you go overseas or to the WNBA. Try that. This, you gotta pay attention. You gotta pay attention. The conversation is really rare. You know, it doesn't happen. All. These are not things that are talked about often or who you should speak with at the university. And I, and I know that's gonna be really helpful for a lot of parents, you mentioned go online and look um, and look at some of the of the players who transferred and do some research. It seems as if parents are inundated with information and finding good sources are difficult. How does a parent sift through all of the information that's out there around what they should know and what they should do and actually be able to help their kid in a non enabling way? Well, the first thing they got to do is figure out with, amongst themselves what's important to them, okay. what's really important. Once, If you don't know what's really important to you, then you don't know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. That's key. You know what I mean? If you know you're the type of parent where your child is the type of child where they're introverted and they need to be close to home, not to come home, but they just have, they just have to feel like if something happened, Mom can come, dad can come, or they can get home. If you're if you're that kind of kid, and you're talking to a school that's ten hours away, why? Right. <laughs> it's a waste of time. You know what I mean? Right. If you know you're an engineer and major, that's what you want to do, and the school doesn't have engineering, and that's very important to you. Why are you still talking to them? Mm -hmm. It's a waste of time. A lot of people waste time. True. Waste time. If you know, for whatever reason, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. You want a female coach because you want a role model, and that's what you want no matter what. And you can explain to me and communicate exactly why you want it. That's very important to you. Then why are you talking to me? You know I'm a guy. Mm -hmm. Why? I'm not going to turn into Ta Taisha. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? But guess what? If I want your child bad enough, not saying this is me per se, but somebody else, they might pretend like, well, shoot, I can, I can, I can be Taisha if that's what you need me to be. You don't want that. You know it's an imposter. But guess what? If your child goes there, and they're gonna do whatever it takes to keep your child there, not to keep your child happy. That's, mm-hmm. There's a difference. There is. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a big difference. One of the- one of the the lifeline obviously of college coaching is the recruiting process right you have to recruit you absolutely have to recruit and get players what do what are some ways that players can communicate best with coaches call them call them don't hide behind instagram don't hide behind facebook don't hide behind twitter because guess what when you're in that program and you're in that office, you can't sit across from your head coach and tweet them or text them, call them. And if, if it's a problem for them to have a, uh, a conversation with you on the phone or face-to-face, can you imagine what, what it would be like to be coached by that person? Sure. Call them. Talk to them. Establish a real, genuine relationship. I'm not saying call them every day, but you got to know that when you pick up that phone and call, they don't answer. Right. Very important. Very important. If you're hoping that they answer, probably the wrong situation. Mm-hmm. You got to know they're going to answer. And if they don't answer, you got to know in your mind, well, there's a reason why they're going to call me back as soon as they can. And you don't even worry about it. It's about building trust, genuine relationships, player-coach relationship. It's, it's similar to father-son, mother-daughter, mother-son relationships. It's not that much different. It's about building trust doing what you say you're going to do, being consistent, understanding discipline, all those same, all those same attributes. It's not that much different. No, that makes sense. And building, building authentic relationships is something that I've heard repeatedly that people struggle with, you know, especially when you're 15, 16, 17 years old and you have all these different coaches something. calling. Let me tell you something. If a, if a coach is telling you, if a coach is spending more time telling you, I'm being real with you, they're lying. <laughs> yeah, I'm just telling you right now, they're Those lying. That's similar to a, a teenager telling you, I'm grown. Right. <laughs> it's the same situation. I tell my daughter all the time, when you become grown, you don't have to tell me. I'm going to know, baby. I'm going to see it in your actions every single day. It's consistent. If a coach is real with you, you don't see it. You don't know. That's why it's important for you to pay attention and do and do what I said before. You have to you have to really research everything around that particular coach. Do your homework. Mm-hmm. But see, we're all we're all we're all guilty of being swayed by emotions. We all like to feel good. We all like to re- release endorphins. So when someone makes you feel good by saying what you want to hear and a smile, you can know it. it you can know if it's a possibility. It may not be true, but it sounds so good you wouldn't give them a chance. Right. That's human nature. That's who we are. Mm-hmm. And coaches play on. They play on that all the time. You know. I, 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 you know how I am. I, uh-huh. I equate uh, recruiting the date. Right. <laughs> Most people they don't put their best foot forward. Why? Because it's something that they want. Mm-hmm. Once they get it, human nature. Most of the time, they don't do what it takes to maintain what they did to get it. Right. So that's why you have to pay attention. Would you say that's the same on the other side as well for players? Like they say, what do you mean? For, do you think that players um, will say, I want this, I want to be great, I'm, I'm going to work hard and then show up? And you- that sounds good. I mean, for the most part. Eric Thomas has a quote, you know, everybody want to be a beast until they realize what beasts do. Right. Everybody wants to be a beast until they realize what beasts do. You understand what that means, right? It Absolutely. sounds good to say you want this and that, but when you realize what it requires to get to that point, it's different. Mm-hmm. It's different. You know, everybody want to. I can't think of a player that I recruited that hadn't told me they want to be a pro. Right, right, right. <laughs> they don't even know what being a pro means. If I told you being a pro meant. You may not see your mama for two years. Yeah. The first thing I'll say is, what you mean? Why I can't see my mama? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pros don't think that way. Pros say, man, I can't see my mama. <sighs> man, all right, I'm going to see it right me. Right. But I got to do. Yeah. <laughs> Being a pro means you may lose your best friend because they may not understand your struggle. They may not understand your work ethic. 
Yeah. Being a best friend means you may lose your boyfriend and your girlfriend. Being a pro, I'm sorry. You may lose your boyfriend and girlfriend. You may be alone. Greatness is lonely. People don't understand that greatness is lonely. You don't get friends until you become great, and those are not real friends. Do you really want that? That's why mm-hmm. so few great people out there. Yep. Yeah. It requires definitely a, a different level of work. Oh, oh. It's, you, you almost have to be look. You have you almost have to be okay with being looked at as crazy. And that's crazy, just the reality yeah. of it. Yeah. If nobody, if not one person is not calling you crazy and you don't find out about it, you're not trying to become great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm that's telling true. you, because good true. is coming. Good mm-hmm. is coming. Good is comfortable. Great, lonely, isolated. Ah, that's a little different, G. A little it different. is. It is a little different. It is very different. I think it's important though that that players when they're going through this process and when you're on campuses that you get challenged to to do what you say you want and challenged to be well, who you say you want to be. Well, well and you're right. And, and, and the problem with that is then that means you need to go to a, a program where they're trying to become great too. Because if they're not trying to become great, how they going to make you become great? Right. They don't know. There's a lot of good coaches High school, AU, elementary, middle, college, pro. But I don't know how many are truly, truly, truly trying to become great. Mm-hmm. That's different. That's different. When you all you care about is the game, you love the game so much, so much that it hurts you when you watch the game and it's not being played the way you see it in your mind. That's yeah. different. It's different when you're watching the game and when you are a former player and it just pains you to see somebody cheating the game the way you did and all you're trying to do is help them not make the same mistakes you made. It's yeah. painful to watch somebody coaching for money when you know that if they cut those salaries in half, half the coaches will be will be involved. That's yeah. different. But guess what? That's normal. It is. You give people a million dollars, they'll learn to like something. Absolutely. <laughs> that don't mean they're going to be great. Right. <laughs> That's different. Eventually, it's going to tell off on them. They'll have money, but they won't have fulfillment. That's different. It's different. Yeah, it what I'm doing, I'll do this. Don't tell them about it, but I'll do this. Yeah, I told you know me. I'll yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'll go get it. I'll go get a job. I don't care where it is, and do this on the side, the exact same way with the exact same intensity, yeah. because I love what I do. Because it's different for me. Yeah. But I can't speak for everybody else. No, it's rare. You know, I'm, I'm really thankful that you um, that I was able to have you as a coach because you you brought this different level of love for the game um, and for life and for people. So what you gave us as players was beyond basketball. I mean, and ball was a part of it because it was like, be, well, you used to be a teacher, so it makes sense exactly. that you are a good teacher. Exactly. But, and I don't mean to cut you off, but you know me, G. I, I tell you this all the time. It's just a vehicle at the end of the day. You know, course, one of my favorite me. phrases is your brain lasts longer than your jump shot. Yep. You know, but I love it so much that when it's time for me to no longer do this, I just hope I go crazy and I'm done. I want to die on basketball. <laughs> I mean, I'm dead serious. Oh, I know. I know. You've for said real. that before. I know. I know. <laughs> the, the love for the game is real. And your love for people and your players is real. Will you talk a little no bit about how players can best prepare to transition? We talked about life after basketball in the lab, I and mean, we've been talking about this for years. And so mm-hmm. what's your vision for the players who cross your path when they finish? How can they best step out in this world ready? Well, the, the first thing is you got to understand that you're on borrowed time. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's one of the things that, you know, my mom is no longer here, God bless her soul, but she wasn't a basketball player. But she would always tell me, boy, I know you love bouncing that basketball, but you can't bounce it for the rest of your life. That was her way of telling me, you got to have something else to do, you know, when basketball no longer works for you. And that's when I knew in the back of my mind it had to be a vehicle. But for me, the profession of coaching was easy because, like you said, I taught sixth grade. I was a teacher. My education, I mean, my major was education. So all I'm doing is teaching in a different format. You know, the court is not my classroom. Practice plans are my lesson plans. It's the exact same thing for me. I'm just doing something that I love to do that I would do for, for free. So I'm blessed. But what most people got to understand 
is you really have to plan and prepare for whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. I mean, you have to like figure out what it is you love. And then when you, when you find that, once you find what that is, you have to be non-negotiable and, and, and making sure that becomes a reality. You know, and that's the thing. A lot of people don't really know what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do nothing else. There's no plan B. <laughs> I know people can't have a plan B. No, it's not, not for me. Nope. I got one plan A. You know what plan B is? To make sure plan A works. Right. <laughs> that's it for me. But this is what I've chosen. So you have to figure out what it is you want to do. And it can't be something that that's only going to last an average of five to seven years because we're all promised 75 years in the Bible. So if you only plan for five years, that means you're 26 on average. you got the majority of your life ahead of you. What do you want to do? What makes you just as happy? I found mine. Yeah. So, you know, young players, you have to figure out what that is. If it's reading, okay, fine. Turn it into a profession. If it's writing, okay, fine. If it's counseling, if it's teaching, if it's engineering, whatever it may be, figure out what it is, dream as, as big as you possibly can, and anybody that's looking at you sideways, when you tell them, don't tell them no more, and don't talk to them no more. Yeah. Pursue it. Plan A, no plan B. Yeah, that, I think one of the things that um, a lot of players struggle with is lack of exposure to mm-hmm. what's possible. So, with um, a lot of the women that I've interviewed and people that I've interviewed, they'll say, well, I didn't even know that, you know, this or that was possible. And so it, having the space to explore while you're still in college, mm-hmm. different career mm-hmm. fields and being willing to step out of your comfort zone and talk to the people in go. the athletics department to learn exactly. about their professions you, and backgrounds. You hit it on the head. You got to be uncomfortable I mean, you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Get out of your comfort zone. You, you hit it on the head, G. That's the key right there. Step out. Talk to different people that, that that's maybe, you know, not coaches or, you know, whatever it may be. You know, a lot of people are afraid to tell you what they really want to do because they think you're going to make fun of them. That's right. the problem. That's how shallow-minded most people are. That's why I said dream big. Be as unrealistic as and, and as impossible as you can. Because if you can accomplish that, yeah, that's what's gonna get. That's what. That's that, that's what's gonna give you the best chance of being fulfilled and ultimately being successful. Where it may be. I, know, I, I can't tell you how many players that I've talked to. I had a player talk. I had a player uh, a few years ago. I was asking, I said, "What do you want to do when you get out of here?" I don't know, Coach. I, I don't know. I'm like, "Come on, girl, really?" And she looked at me. She smiled. Well, I kind of know what I want to do. I said, well, "What is it?" You're gonna laugh at me. I said, I'm going to laugh at you if you don't tell me what you want to do. Right. Now, I'm not going to laugh at you. Well, I love shoes. I just want to run foot locker. I said, beautiful. Do it. She looked at me like, really? I said, why not? You love shoes. I can't think of a better person to buy shoes from than you. Why not? Do it. If you don't care about money, you can be the best shoe salesman in the world. If you want to own foot locker, you can do that too. Why not do it? To this day, she called me. I can't believe you were supportive. But I'm doing what I love to do, and I'm happy. That's what you got to do. Don't listen to people. People are telling you what they think you should do. They're giving you their version of your dream. Uh, you can't subscribe to that. Because I guarantee you half those people are unhappy. Because they're, they, they're doing what they think they should do as opposed to what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I promise you. We're out. They could be mad. I know millionaires who are unhappy. <laughs> Seriously. You're I mean anything. You're right. You're right. And the the beauty of you as a coach and as a person is you have always been willing to be affirming. In addition to being honest and critical, but affirming always. And and the players who you who've crossed your path, that is something that we all take with us. So it didn't matter if it was the player who played forty minutes a game or if it was the player that didn't play at all. Like you treated us all the same. And that is something that that players never forget. Mm-hmm. I got an interesting perspective, though. I don't even know if I ever told you this. A lot of people don't know this. Well, they pay attention, they would, but a lot of people don't know this. My perspective is so unique and so different. I'm going to explain to you why. Growing up from age five through my freshman year in college, I was always the best player on my team. Always. Mm-hmm. Always. 
the best player, not one of the best, the best. Freshman year in college, I was playing behind a guy who got drafted to play for the Houston Rockets, right? My freshman year. Okay. Out of all the scholarship players, I got the least amount of minutes. So technically, I could have, I could have been considered the worst player on the team. So I saw the difference between how I was treated when I was considered the best versus the, how I was treated when they basically felt like I couldn't help them at that particular time. Mm-hmm. It was obvious because I, I I was in both. I was I went from one end of the spectrum to the other end in a matter of three or four months. Okay. And at that particular age, I didn't understand. I'm like, why? I don't man. I felt. I mean, my self esteem was shot. I mean, I felt like I could play. I felt like I couldn't even catch a pass because I wasn't playing. And I had no coach bring me in and say, hey, look, you're playing behind a future pro, Ty. Mm-hmm. Take your time. It's going to be okay. I had nobody tell me that. So I didn't know. But I remembered those lessons. So when I got older, I was like, wow. Now that I'm coaching, I can relate to everybody. You know why? Because I've been everybody. You can't tell me what it feels like to be the best player, and I don't know about it. You can't tell me what it feels like to be considered the worst player, and I don't know about it. So as a coach, I can talk to the, the first player or the 15th player. or the It doesn't matter because I've been in both places. And my thing is, I've always told myself, you know, if I was ever blessed to be, you know, a coach and, 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 and do what it is I want to do, I would always be the coach I wish I had. Mm. So this is easy for me. Easy. That makes sense. I'm not saying I don't make I'm not saying I don't make the face right. now, but my heart is still. It's easy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense so, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I have a, an affinity for what the best player is going through and for what the player who's not getting no minutes is going through. I'm simply there for both because I've been both. I understand what it feels like. Yeah. When you think about when you think about your coaching career thus far and your continued coaching career, what do you want your legacy to be? That's a great question. When I'm dead and gone and, you know, you're always more important when you're no longer here. I hate that, but it's the truth. You know, I was listening to uh, Beyonce's mom yesterday and she made a comment, a quote, well, she said a quote rather where, my grandmother, my grandmother and my mom just said it too. You need to give people their flowers while they can still smell. Yeah. It's the same thing, but it doesn't happen. They wait till you go and they tell, you, they tell everybody else how great you are. But my thing is, I just want people to say, you know what? Man, that dude right there, Coach Shad, man, he never changed. Good dude. Cared beyond words. Like, I can't explain to you how much dude cared, how much he just wanted us to be successful, and he gave us everything he had for all the right reasons. And he loved basketball so much, that's why he died on the basketball court. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. Well, Ty, I just want to thank you for all that you've done and been and meant to me in my life and in my um, growth as a young woman. Um, thank you for the wisdom over the years. Really appreciate it. And I know there's a lot of other players who feel the same way. If I know there's no. easy... Oh, you can go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I cut you off again. I'm sorry. I'm so rude. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I know that there are NCAA rules around contacting, but if there's a parent who has a question about the process, um, how could people reach out to you? She got all the information. I can't believe you just asked me that. I know. Well, some give. people give Twitter give. or... Listen. Give. I don't. I give whoever call you or talk to you or whatever. Give them Twitter. Are you serious? Give them my number. Okay. Come on, G. I can't believe you asked me that. Really? <laughs> you know how I am. I know. If they're talking to you and asking you, and you feel like I could help them, you know how I am. Give them my number. Okay. Don't tweet me or text me. Give them my number. I will. I will give them your number. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you, and I hope to see you soon. You know I love you, baby, but listen, if it wasn't you, you know I wouldn't be doing this, right? <laughs> I love you soon. Look, yes, I know that. You know, you know I don't like paparazzi. It's only because it's you. Like, uh, nobody else. That's it. Never again. <laughs> 
This is Athletes as Educators. Thank you for listening to the Athletes as Educators podcast. Connect with me through the Athletes as Educators Facebook page or at Athletes Educate on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode and go over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. For more resources and information about today's podcast, you can check us out at AngelaRLewis.com.